And today we will learn a couple more ways to show that two triangles are congruent, or prove that they're congruent. First we have an ASA, angle side angle. Now you may uh, notice a certain similarity between this and the last one, which was side angle side. And the important part was that the angle between the two congruent sides was the congruent angle. It couldn't be angle side side or side side angle. It had to be side angle side. In this case, it has to be the side in between the two congruent angles. For instance, this postulate doesn't say that if we have two congruent angles and any old congruent side, then they're congruent. That's a theorem. And that's over here. It's kind of a drag that they list it separately, because this is the much more general one. Here, you have to have the side in between the two congruent angles. <coughs> Here we have a theorem, which is really much more powerful, that says as long as you've got two angles that are congruent and one side, any side, pick a side, doesn't matter, the two triangles are congruent. That's way more powerful than this. This will be much easier to use. And the fact is, if this holds, then this must hold, I guess, well, they're actually trying to imply that the side is not the one in between the two. And it's pretty sure that if you accept this, this would follow almost automatically. Because if you put the two together, for sure, you have a situation which says two angles in any old side. You've got congruence. This one says the side is outside the two angles. This one says the side is between the two angles. Put them together and you've got two angles at any old side. Fairly simple. I mean, it's not a whole lot to this. It's not complicated. I don't know. It's not super abstract. It's just two more ways you can use to prove that triangles are congruent. With the two that we just added, that's these last two in line here, we have five ways to prove the triangles are congruent. If all three sides are congruent, that works. Two sides and the angle in between, that works. We have a very specific one for right triangles. The hypotenuse and the legs are congruent and the triangle's congruent. And these are the, the two we just mentioned. Angle side, angle, and angle, angle side. And when you put them all together, it means any two angles in any side. Either this one applies or this one applies. So if you've got two angles and a congruent side, you have triangle congruence. These are all the important things we've done so far in proving uh, triangle congruence. These are the big ones. Important to know. Most of what we do in this section is all based on what you already know, except we're going to add in these two, the postulate and the theorem. Since the ASA and AAS are really the only two actual new things in this section, let's just jump right into doing some problems here. Uh-oh. That dumb guy made a mistake again. Let's see what he did this time. Well, he's concluded that ABC is congruent to XYZ by the angle, angle, angle theorem. Well, that'd be great if there was such a thing. But and 
just a second ago I put this thing up here and I don't see an AAA anywhere in here, do you? That's because there isn't one. And so he only one made uh, one small mistake here. He cited a theorem which doesn't exist. You can't do that. You can't just make up your own theorems and postulates. If you did that, math would be too easy and it would defeat the purpose of forcing you to learn math in order to make you miserable. I think I've pointed out before that uh, that is the whole point of math classes. It's just to make high school students miserable. If that's what you thought, well, congratulations, you figured it out. And if, if we allowed you to just make up your own theorems, well, the misery factor would drop so low it would hardly even be worth doing. Okay. Here's a pretty easy one. <coughs> that happens to be a right angle here. So you immediately start thinking about our right angle theorems, of which we only have one. That's the hypotenuse leg theorem, and we don't see anything here about our hypotenuses, or hypotenuse. However, what's true for regular triangles is true for right triangles. Right triangle is just a specific case of an ordinary triangle. And what do we have here? Well, we have two angles are congruent and a side. So, we just put that up there. Angle, angle, side. Angle, angle, side. So, here it is. Angle, angle, side. That works. That's, and that's it. Well, here they're asking us if we have enough information to conclude that two triangles are congruent. I went ahead and drew a picture. I think I've mentioned before. <laughs> My ability to visualize is right up there with the squirrels. So, let's draw in what they're telling us here. Angle B is congruent to angle E. Okay. So, put a little thingy there. Those are congruent. Angle C is congruent to angle F. Hmm. Okay. AC is congruent to DE. Well, angle, angle, side, angle, angle, yeah. I would say that we have by angle, angle, side theorem. Wait a minute. Yes, angle, angle, side is the theorem. Angle, side, angle is the postulate. So, they, we do have enough information to show that they're congruent by the angle, angle, side theorem. Very easy. Now, can we show that these two triangles are congruent? Well, the fact that we have two parallel lines here might be a big help. Let's see here. We have although I'm guessing we're not going to be able to do it, but we'll see. For, by the vertical angles, we know that this angle is congruent to this angle. These little arrows here tell us that AB and ED are parallel, which means these alternate interior angles are congruent. And this is also, this is one transversal, here's another transversal, and here's two more alternate interior angles. So we have all three angles are congruent. Okay, now, are any of the sides congruent? Well, gee, I don't see how we would know if they were. Nothing has been added to this drawing to indicate. It doesn't say that, uh, for instance, if C were a midpoint, hey, we'd have something then. But 
there's nothing here to tell us that any of these sides are congruent to any other side. All we have is the three angles. And as I pointed out a few minutes ago, there is no angle, angle, angle theorem. There's a side, side, side or theorem, but there's no uh, theorem. Well, here's one where we're going to use the, uh, the graph and apply some of the theorems that we've used. All we have to do is uh, show that these angles are congruent. And then show that ABC is congruent to CDA. Tell you the truth, I don't understand this problem. Because I think it would be very easy to show this. And once you've shown this, the rest of it just falls out. Because the angles in congruent triangles are all congruent. But what they want us to do is show that uh, let's see here. See that this angle here Which angle is it? Yeah, let's see. C oh, okay, I see. C A D. This angle here is congruent to this angle here. Well, I guess what they really want us to do is use slopes. Remember they taught us about slopes just a few sections ago, so they probably expect us to use them. That's the kind of people they are. So, what's the slope of this line here? You see, if we use slopes, then we can show that these lines are parallel. Once we know these lines are parallel, we've got them cut by a transversal one. Now we got something that'll tell us all kinds of things about the angles. First, we have to know if these, this line and this line is parallel. Pardon me, this line and this line are parallel. So let's check it out. 6 minus 5 over 6 minus 2. And I'd say that's one fourth. Is that right? Rise over the run, yeah. What about this one? Well, let's try two minus one. Over four minus zero. Hey, son of a gun. We know they're parallel, so let's put some little arrows on there, just like they do in the books. These two lines are, well, <laughs> really bad, really, really bad. Try it again. There we go. If these lines are parallel, then this angle is congruent. To this angle, well, let's see what we got here. Let's do it their way. C A B. Oh, I guess I am doing it their way. N A C B. Okay. <laughs> so th these two angles are congruent. A C. Wait a minute. Here we go. A C D. That would be this angle here. And I hope they're talking about B A C or C A B. Yeah, they are. Okay. So there's two hash marks for that one and two hash marks for this one. So what do we have here? This angle's congruent to this angle. This angle's congruent to this angle and this side is congruent to itself. So what do we have? It looks like angle, side, angle. And that in fact is how you know that these two triangles are congruent. You could do other things. I may have mentioned once or twice before there's more than one way to solve a math problem. You could have computed the distance here using our distance formula. And if you did that you would find that these two sides are congruent to these two. Actually this side is congruent to this side, this side is congruent to this side, and of course this side is congruent to itself. So from the side, side, side postulate, you would not only know that the triangles were congruent, you would know that all the corresponding angles are congruent. And working backwards, you would show these two results. They expected you to use the slope on this one.
probably because we just studied slope a few topics back. Well, here, first they ask us to uh, graph some lines. That's fairly easy, except... So I've graphed the lines here, and of course, notice the first two lines in our slope-intercept form have the same slope, slope of 2. So they're parallel, and uh, luckily they look parallel, don't they? And then the line x equals 0, that's just a straight up and down line here. That's in fact, that's the y-axis is what it is. Now, let's consider the equation mx plus 1. Well, they're asking you if we have now a fourth line with the equation mx plus 1, which means we know it passes through the point 1. For what values of m will the graph form two triangles? Well, hmm. If it's positive, and I should have pointed out up here that uh, the y-intercept for this line is 5. So this actually is... So there is a, an intersection point here, and of course down here. And I should draw this in heavier, just to... There we go. Now, if we draw this line in heavier, this line intersects here, and this one intersects down here at minus 3. Okay, so far. Now, if we have a line that passes through the point 1, what slope can it have that will produce more triangles? Well, it seems to me any positive slope will come down here and produce a triangle up here and then produce a triangle down here. What about negative slopes? Well, pardon me, this was a negative slope. What about positive slopes? Any positive slope? Well, no matter how we draw this, as long as it's not parallel, which means a slope of 2 is out. What about 0? Hmm. Yeah, I think 0 works because we just draw a straight line through here. And we'll, create a, and we'll create a triangle down here and another one up here. What about an undefined slope? Well, that's kind of a problem. If we draw another line parallel to this one, another one with an undefined slope, we're not going to end up with triangles. Problem is we got... We need a third line that's not parallel to anything, so it can intersect We can't have another one with a slope of 2. That's not going to do any good. It'll do, it'll cross this line, and just like these two do, but there's no way to close it off. And another one parallel to this, that won't do any good either. So M could be just about anything in order to produce two triangles. It just can't be equal to 0. Uh, pardon me. It can't be equal to 2. And it can be undefined. That is, it can't be vertical. Uh, I could do this. And then draw a circle around it. And then the big, there, that's the international symbol for it can't be vertical. What's the second part of the, equa of the uh, question? For what values of m will those values be congruent? Well, that is an interesting question. Now I drew in a, just an arbitrary line here. And what do we have? Are these triangles congruent? Let's see here. This angle is congruent to this angle. Okay. And because these two lines are parallel, this angle is congruent to this angle. Alternate interior angles. And do the same thing over here.
So we can easily show that the three angles are congruent, are any of the sides which we have created congruent? Well, yes. These two. This one here is always going to go from 1 to minus 3. That's 4. And from 1 to 4, or pardon me, from 1 to 5, that's also 4. So the length of these two segments is the same. And we can use our angle side angle by showing it. We know these two vertical angles are congruent. And then we can use up, uh, opposite interior angles are congruent. So we have this angle is congruent to this angle, this angle is congruent to this angle, and this side is congruent to this side. Now, is that, which means that the two triangles are congruent, the question is, was there something magical about the way I drew this line? Well, sort of. It went through the point one. But other than that, if I drew it differently, would the arguments I just made not hold? Well, I don't know. Let's just try it. Suppose down here and there. Now it's passing through the point one, has a negative slope, and I've created a triangle here and a triangle here. But these, this side and this side, of course, congruent. This angle, this angle congruent. And this angle and this angle are congruent because they're opposite interior angles, and this is a transversal cutting these two parallel lines. So, as long as the slope isn't equal to 2, or the line isn't vertical, we will always produce two congruent triangles. Hmm, kind of cool, huh? Now here's one that I like because it introduces something... Well, it's a version of triangulation. Uh, triangulation is used in surveying in which uh, you actually use triangles. This demonstrates a version of triangulation which is used in navigation. Uh, VFR pilots use it all the time. Although the machinery does most of the calculations for you. By the way, VFR means visual flight rules as opposed to instrument flying. And actually, instrument flight pilots would use it as well, but they've got tons of different instruments. There are uh, VFR stations which you can use. And I'll explain how that works in just a second because it's exactly the way this thing works. So let's do this one first and then I'll show you how you do it in an airplane. Uh, let's see, we got an oak tree. Hmm? Oh, they're at a large oak tree. All right, well, let's see. Let's say the oak tree is over here. I guess, I don't know. Put it right there, see what happens. Maybe that's a good spot, maybe not. We'll say due east is that way. On a real map, it usually is. North is up, east is off to the right. 250 yards. Hmm. And let's suppose each of these is uh, 25 yards. That's 8 and 2 is 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So, 250 yards. Like I said, I'm counting each of these grids as 25 yards. So, here we are at the boulder. Now, there's a maple tree that is 50 degrees west of north. Now, west is that way. West of north of the boulder. So, first I will draw a line. 50 degrees west of north. Well, let's see. I just happen to know that with a slope of 1, that's 45 degrees, right? And they say 50 degrees west, so that's going to be a little bit off. Okay, but that's all we know. It's 50 degrees. We'll call that 50. I don't know if it is or not. And 
35 degrees east of north of the old oak tree. Remember, we started with the oak tree down here, and that's 35 degrees east. Well, again, that's 45 degrees. So, a little bit less, and it intersects up here. That's how we know where we are. That's, in other words, these two lines are going to intersect, aren't they? I mean, they just did. I don't <laughs> so we actually found a point, but we didn't have any distances. We had a distance here to this rock. So we got the tree to the rock. But now, I mean, we knew where it was because they gave us direction, east, and distance. But the next two, they didn't give us any distance. They just told us the direction. But they told us the direction from two different points. That's the key. If they told us two different directions from the same point, that wouldn't do you any good. But if you've got two directions from two different points, wherever those lines intersect, that must be the location. So the, the answer is... What was the question, anyway? Well, the question was, can you locate the maple tree? Yes, it's at the point where these two lines intersect. Explain. Well, I guess that is the explanation. Where these two lines intersect, that's where it is. Now, when, you, when you're flying a small airplane, I don't mean riding in one, I mean you're, you're actually flying it, they have these things called VFR stations all over the place. And what happens is, you get this station here. It's broadcasting. It broadcasts in all directions. You have an instrument that will tell you the direction from you to that VFR station. So you grab your instrument and figure out what the direction is. Suppose you decide, you determine from your instruments that you're direction is like this. You don't know where you are. All you know is that and this part probably isn't so good. Probably don't need that. So you're over here at say 30 degrees west of north. Okay. That just tells you you're along this line somewhere. What about another VFR station over here? Now you tune into that station and figure out its direction from you. And you determine that it's say, 30 degrees north of east. Now, now you know right where you are. You're right here. And in, if you were really flying, you would have a uh, chart. That's what pilots call maps. They just call them charts. And there'd be a location for a VFR station here on your chart. And you'd tune into it. It broadcasts a radio signal and you'll determine your direction. That just tells you what line you lie on relative to this. Then you'll turn into another VFR station. You'll draw yourself a couple of lines and you will know that you're right here. And you do this on a chart and if this spot right here is turns out to be Denver, you will know from having triangulated your position that you are right over Denver. I think you would probably know that if you look down. But just for the sake of argument, suppose it was a, uh, a smaller town that was less obvious. Or suppose you wanted to fly by something that couldn't be seen from the ground. Lots of things are covered by trees. The point is, once you know two directions, you can always figure out where you are. 
and you can do that. You don't actually have to be in an airplane to do that. Although these days, I mean, I would say just take a GPS with you. And pretty much makes the whole thing pretty easy. Well, now that you know how to navigate, go hop in a plane and go for a ride. Oh, wait. Learn to fly first. Yeah. Actually, I think you could probably use this out in the woods, too, if you had... Uh, well, if you got a compass and there were some, like you went up on a hill and you could see some landmarks that were on your chart, you could figure out where you were. But like I said, <laughs> GPS units are pretty cheap now. And they'll give you your coordinates in a few seconds <laughs> without much work or calculations. I know computers make all this seem kind of pointless, but you never know. You might be programming a computer someday and you'll need to know this. Well, that's about it for this video.